Good afternoon. Welcome to Building a JavaScript Library. Uh, we're very happy to have uh, John Resig here with us today. John is a JavaScript evangelist, and he works for Mozilla Corporation. And he is the author of the book Pro JavaScript Techniques. Uh, he's also the creator and lead developer of the jQuery JavaScript Library. And he is the co-designer of the Fuel JavaScript Library, which will be included in Firefox 3, is included in Firefox 3. Uh, and he's currently located in Cambridge, Massachusetts. So uh, thank you all for coming today. And here's John. Well, I want to thank everyone for uh, coming out today. I really appreciate it. Uh, so just a little background on myself. Um, I, I am the lead developer of jQuery. I work for Mozilla. Um, uh, so I, do, I still do jQuery in the evenings, uh, so to speak. And uh, Mozilla, I'm, I straight, right now I'm uh, promoting uh, JavaScript too. I'm really excited about that. But today, I'm here to talk about um, specifically the two libraries that I have experience uh, in building uh, and maintaining, and how to how to how to apply what I learned uh, into building your own JavaScript library. So uh, the first library that. Uh, became something uh, that I built. Uh, it was uh, called a uh, jQuery. I uh, released this early last year, and it, it explicitly focused on uh, DOM traversal. The DOM traversal was the absolute core of the library, and then there was a bunch of extra um, things in, uh, so events and AJAX and animations. And the primary focus of the library was in having uh, being able to write really succinct code. Um, while, and having a small file size, while still being extensible uh, via a plugin architecture. If you've never seen jQuery uh, uh, script, this is uh, some brief examples. Uh, jQuery is focused on, um, you can break it down into two parts. The first part is where you find something, the second part is where you perform an action against it. In, and so in jQuery, you're always finding something. I use uh, CSS selectors and it finds a set of elements, and then you perform an action against them. So in the, uh, in the top one there, you find all divs that are inside uh, the element that has an ID of main, and you're adding a class to them. Or you're performing an animation, or binding an event, or loading a, a document in through Ajax. Um, and personally, I'd like to think that, we've, uh, that uh, I did something at least decent with jQuery. Currently, the, we have about 25 people working on jQuery in all various aspects of it. Like about a quarter million uh, visitors per month, and this is on Google Trends here. Uh, you, can, you can probably guess which one is uh, jQuery, and these are the other popular JavaScript libraries like uh, Prototype and Dojo. Uh, so I think, I think we're doing pretty well for ourselves at the moment. The other library that I have experience with is called Fuel. This is going to be in Firefox 3, and it's designed for extension developers. Uh, currently, uh, you can use uh, JavaScript to develop an extension, uh, interacting with something called XPCOM. Um, and I don't know if you've, uh, who here has uh, had experience writing an extension. It isn't the most fun thing in the world, uh, and it could be a lot better. So Fuel is designed for that. It's designed to help uh, web developers get into writing extensions. So there's all sorts of helpers for bookmarks, events, preferences. Um, it's written in pure JavaScript. Uh, and it's designed to be extensible. So here's some quick ex uh, examples. So here we're going through all, uh, all the preferences and finding all the preferences that, are mo uh, that have been modified by the user, uh, looking for when the application, when, looking for when Firefox is quitting, when the user is quitting Firefox, opening a new tab and activating it, and then removing all Google bookmarks uh, from, your, uh, uh, from your bookmark cache. So I, I generally distill um, JavaScript library authoring into these topics. And I'll, I'm going to frantically try to cover them all today. Um, so all, all the way from your initial design, of when you're designing the API that you want to implement, all the way down to uh, maintaining the code that you've written. So there's a lot here. The first part uh, of writing a solid API is uh, that I find to be incredibly important is that your code should be uh, orthogonal. And what I mean by that is that uh, whenever you perform an action on an, an object, it should always be performed everywhere. 
Um, and I like to use the analogy of, you know, the, of uh, CRUD, in that you, uh, in, in CRUD you, you can, you know, add, you know, add, remove, modify, delete. And so I, I, I like to use that when designing a new API. So in Fuel, every single object has the same methods and properties. So for every object, so for all bookmarks, to, to get all bookmarks, you do bookmarks.all. To get all preferences, it's preferences.all. In order to get to add a new preference, it's prefs.add or bookmarks.add. It's the same thing for every single API and using the same method names and the same conventions. So that way, if you know how to do preferences, for example, and you want to do bookmarks, there's no learning curve because since you already know it, it's the same. Um, and what I think this is particularly important is that, for example, in jQuery, uh, when I first implemented it, I forgot to add a remove attribute function. Um, and it was missing literally for months, and, and simply because it, it wasn't as popular as adding an attribute value. Um, but if, if uh, I had taken time when I first started to map out, okay, if I'm adding an attribute somewhere I should be you know, removing it as well, then I probably would have caught that. Granted, it, it's in now, so that's not really an issue. So specifically with Fuel, uh, I made a grid is such that uh, you would have uh, literally the columns were add, remove, modify, delete, or sorry, add, remove, modify, and uh, you know the rows were each piece of functionality, so you know a preference or whatever, and then uh, and I could literally just fill in the blanks uh, and say, okay, have we have we figured this one out yet? Have we done this one? And make sure that we have complete coverage of the API. Another point when writing. Uh, an API is that you should fear adding new items into your API. You need to keep it as small as possible because every single method that you add, you're going to have to support. So that means uh, you know that f so somewhat indefinitely, if you if you add in a single method, you need to be able to pre sort of precognitively uh, you know uh, pre uh, anticipate what users are going to be doing with that. Um, so I think wherever possible, if, if you can get away with not adding in a method, you should. And so in jQuery, uh, I, at one point I added in some methods uh, for CSS helpers. So like dot top, dot left, and dot background. And they weren't used a whole lot, but they provided a, a, an extra, I would consider to be bloat on top of the API, since there was already a, a CSS method for manipulating CSS properties. Uh, so I added them in, and then people were using them, and we had to support them. And then when it came, you know, when I decided that it just weren't necessary, and removed and decided to remove them, it, it was it was a hassle. Uh, so I, I I consider that you should just seriously think about anything that goes in. And now uh, I'm I'm very very uh, stingy whenever anything goes into jQuery. You should embrace removing code um, wherever possible. If there's if there's and again, going back to supporting, because uh, you, if you're writing a library, you have to support everything that's in it. So you should, uh, wherever possible, remove code that could be handled elsewhere. Um, by, redu it, you, by reducing the size of your API, you make it easier to learn. Uh, you decrease your file size, which is especially important in JavaScript. And it, makes, it generally makes your code more maintainable. If there's less code there, it's going to be easier to maintain. So a long time ago in jQuery, uh, uh, I had implemented a full CSS3 selector uh, syntax. And there's a, I don't know if any of you have ever used CSS3 selectors. It's a really stupid specification. And yeah, there's, there's a lot of really bad stuff in there. For example, you can select all children, but you can't select your parent. You can select an adjacent sibling, next adjacent sibling, but you can't eject a previous adjacent sibling. It, it's just like really, like they, they, like they so they, they did not think orthogonal. They, they were like, oh, let's just select next and let's, who cares about previous? And it's really frustrating to deal with. So I actually ran a poll uh, where I had people check off each selector item that they actually have used. Um, and, and then at the end, there was a whole bunch that nobody checked. Uh, and, and, and there was one that was uh, like, nth of type. Um, I don't know if anyone's ever heard of that one, but it selects the, the nth child of a specific, uh, specific type. And uh, some people had checked that, and we found out that they could actually just use nth child. So we were able to remove a large chunk of the CSS3 specification 
uh, which is good and bad, and that we're no longer completely compliant. But at the same time, no one was using them to begin with, so we reduced our, our total API and made things easier to maintain. And so in 1.1, additionally, this is, is separate, in jQuery 1.1, we reduced the size of the API by 47%, uh, just removing methods and stuff that didn't need to be there. So, so the metric here was uh, each uh, AP, API item we had to document. So if we had to document something, so we removed 47% of what we had to document as well, which is great, because uh, <laughs> that means they have to write less. Yes? So, I mean, we always want to remove, like, deprecated methods and stuff like that, but how do you do that without uh, breaking people's websites? Like, um, for I'm, the Maps API, which is hot link. All right, so how do you not break? Think, okay, provide an upgrade path. The important point is that you can't just willy-nilly remove stuff. Otherwise, it, it's, it's not, not feasible. So there's two ways to do it. Um, in, in, with jQuery, what we do is uh, if we change the API, uh, so like from 1.0 to 1.1, we change the API, and provided a plugin on top of 1.1 that gave one... 1.0 users an API that felt like 1.0. Another way to do it is to give 1.0 users an API that feels like the 1.1 API. So I mean, you, you can point, decide which direction you want to point. Personally, um, I think pointing backwards is easier since uh, the more, generally the more modern API, you don't want to be duplicating functionality. Um, and so the, uh, by, by providing a plugin, so they would just use the new API then directly beneath it include a backwards compatibility API. And all the old plugins and all the old code would just work. It nothing, like nothing had changed at all. So on that note, to do that though, you should have done your versioning identification problem. The Maps API actually does that nicely, because I guess you can do it. Yeah. You probably identified your versions cleanly, right? So yep, so the question was, uh, you know, it, did you identify your versions cleanly? Uh, and and you know, obviously, and, and Map does, uh, Maps, uh, inc uh, with uh, identifying versions. So yeah, it, it's pretty important that you do cleanly identify so that users know at which point they're upgrading from or to. Although we serve the most, we have a version two, but that, that changes every two weeks. So if we change something that's in version two, yeah. which is currently 2.86, then it will break anyone. We should have a version three that gets to be two. Right, yeah. we could, I mean, that's what we, we made a big jump from one to two, and that's what we, we were able to get rid of removing things, but it's always a concern for us removing anything from two. Yeah, so the, that, that's, a, that's a tricky point, because uh, so the, it, the question was over, um, you know, that the version two, the, the, the minor releases of version two keep breaking things. Um, so it, and that's something we, we, we tried to stop in jQuery a while ago, and that anything, so 1.1 may break something, but 1.1.1 won't break anything. Uh, I mean, obviously that's, uh, uh, I, I don't, I'm not sure what kind of issue that is, other than to say that maybe it, whatever file that users directly hotlink to should be something that's not API changing, but give them an option to, to, to link to the bleeding edge. Uh, you know, so differentiate between a stable versus a bleeding edge. Um, with API, you should always, uh, and this goes back again to simplifying your API, reduce your API to its most common root. Um, and then, because when you do that, you can have uh, a core function that you can build on top of. So right now, in jQuery 1.2, I'm actually removing these three methods here. Um, and so that you could get, for example, the, the first element, uh, the first three elements, or sorry, everything after the first three elements and everything before the first two. And uh, these were kind of, they're kind of kludgy. And when I, I was looking at this, I realized that there's already an awesome method for this and whose usage is already known called slice. The jQuery, I don't know if you're not familiar with it, the jQuery uh, object, it behaves like an array. Um, and so if, by implementing, um, a slice method, you can now have a huge amount of power being able to do things that you couldn't even do with this, and we reduced our API by 67%. <laughs> um, consistency. You, uh, when, when writing your API, you should be consistent everywhere. 
obviously this is easiest if, you're, if it's one person writing the API. Uh, if it's not, you should write up your guidelines ahead of time so that everyone knows what is expected. And I, and I break down consistency into three areas. The most obvious is naming. Uh, if, the, if you're going to pick a naming convention, you know, if you're using camel case or not, or uh, you know, if you, like for events, if you want to do dot on click versus dot click. So in jQuery, we do dot click for no particular reason other than that's the convention that we adopted. So by doing that, that is what users should expect going forward. Um, argument position. So when someone calls uh, one of your methods, they should know in, wh in which order to expect to be able to pass things in. So specifically, uh, being, passing in an options object. So just in, in JavaScript, uh, just a native object that has key value pairs, but, you know, properties and values. Um, in, J in jQuery, we always pass that in first, always, I everywhere in the API. And if we ever have a callback function, that's always the last item in a method. So by having that at least a little bit of convention, users can expect that if they want to have a callback to something, it's always going to be the last item, and they can expect that. And within uh, a callback, you should always make sure that the, uh, the context uh, uh, is the same everywhere. So, because if the context is constantly changing, sometimes if it's an object, sometimes if it's an element, no one will know how to interact with it. So in jQuery, uh, the context is always refers to the DOM element with its, uh, with, that it's referenced to. So implementation. So this is the, what I consider to be the, the, progress, the evolution of a JavaScript coder. So, when, when, so it goes something like, when someone's just starting out, they, they, at least a programmer coming into JavaScript, is something like, oh man, everything is a reference. This is great, you know, it's, it's objects, I can understand this, you know, it, I understand how this works. And then, then they realize that they can do object-oriented code. And you know, just, it's sort of quirky, they kind of understand it, they're doing object-oriented. And then suddenly it clicks how to do object prototypes. And then you, know, the, there's, you can see this, you can usually tell how someone's advanced through JavaScript. Where they hit some point and they're like, prototypes, I understand. And then they try it and they do everything with object prototypes. And then I think the, the final progression of a JavaScript coder is when they realize that all the other stuff's good, but it's all about closures. And that, there's, and that their code just suddenly becomes this, this giant closure minefield of different scopes and contexts. And so the, there's, a, there's a couple, uh, uh, quite a few coders who I really aspire uh, who have you know, fantastic use of closures in their code and is just really a thing of beauty. I, well, uh, so teaching them Lisp first, uh, that would probably break their soul. But, um, <laughs> but I do consider functional programming to be an absolutely Im imperative concept. And that, uh, you know, in the, is it, but the, um, yeah, I was saving that one. All right, so the, so for, especially for functional programming, um, uh, that understanding closures, I, you know, not only does it make you a better programmer, it especially makes you a better JavaScript programmer. Um, and so this snippet here, having an anonymous function wrapped and executed is one of the most powerful constructs that you can use in JavaScript. It gives you... Uh, just an, an anonymous scope that you can interact in, and you can define local local variables within this scope that isn't accessible outside. And you will see this used again and again in in, in code in, in different variations, but it's really important. And it, it, it and it sort of uh, you know, transfers down to other concepts. So like being able to um, write you know, uh, essentially macros of, of to some degree. So having, uh, you know, generating custom functions on the fly. So here we uh, are generating three new jQuery methods uh, dynamically that encapsulate another piece of functionality. And this is all using closures because this name here is, is within this scope. And here's another snippet. I like this one a lot. It's, just, it's similar to the last one with this difference. So you can call functions in, in, in JavaScript within a different context. 
And what happens is, is that whenever you call an anonymous function in, uh, in JavaScript, its default context is the window object, the, the global object, which doesn't really help you. Uh, so if you call it with the call method, and you set its context to this, you now have a context that's equal to the current scope. And you can have local variables. So I, th I consider this to be deceptively powerful. And until, at least until JavaScript 2 comes along, or at least now with uh, JavaScript 1.7, you can have uh, let statements, and you can have locally defined variables. Uh, I think this is a, a, a neat little salve that will hold you over. Um, Say again? Do they have an equivalent of an F-flat? Because there's a left, right, for binding lexical language. Yeah, yeah, and that's... Because there's an F-flat where you can bind in the lexical function, or does it just use the same as it's called? You mean a, meaning to, like, a block? Yeah. Yeah, yep, and so you can... You can that's exactly what you can do. Um, so, so in JavaScript 1.7, is there... Uh, so there's a, a normal let, um, you know, a statement. And then you can also do let... Uh, and then it'll be within this block. Uh, so it w within this within this uh, within this block here, this variable will be equal to 100, and, as opposed to this one, which will be equal to it within the, the whole the whole block. Encapsulation. This is uh, a, a really important point for developing. Uh, reusable and embeddable Java, you know, JavaScript libraries. So if you want, to, want your library to be able to live with other libraries and, or, and other random pieces of code, you really need to do this because you don't want your code escaping and potentially harming other people's code. So uh, I'll, I'll be getting more into this in a second, but you, you, you just want to make sure that nothing of yours, no variables that you define, leak out and affect uh, how other people write. Since um, since it's JavaScript, you really can. You can just blow away anyone else's code. And the, uh, so a nice part of this is that, so if you wrap this construct again, it comes up again, if you wrap your entire library in it, and then you define variables within that scope, compressors can make optimizations. So for example, Dojo's compressor, it looks at variables within a scope that don't escape that scope, and they can do rewriting of them so that the variable names can change from you know, my long variable name into you know, A. And, then, and so within that scope, you can use an optimized variable name that compresses really, really nicely into a, you know, a minified code. Namespacing. Um, this namespacing has the potential to become very verbose. Uh, and it's really easy to get lost. Um, some libraries do this better than others. And, but, the, but the goal of namespacing is that you want to use as few global variables as possible. The less global variables that you use and the less that you modify global objects, the better. Because your code will, will just be a better citizen of the page that you're currently in. Right now, uh, there's a couple libraries that do one namespace fairly well. Dojo, Yahoo, UI, uh, jQuery. MokiKit is a little bit dicey in that they have a one global namespace, but they automatically introduce everything um, into the global namespace, and then they have to like retract it again. It, it's a little bit weird, um, but Dojo, Yahoo, UI, and, and jQuery, at least, um, do it pretty cleanly. And these are some questions that I like to ask, in that uh, it says, can my code coexist with other random code on the site? This is usually the, the easiest one to obtain, in that you want to make sure that none of your code blows away anyone else's code, or affects anyone else's code. And you also want to make sure that no one else's random code, no matter how badly it's written, will affect your code. So if they extend the object prototype, uh, you, you need to still work. I mean, it, you, you can tell people not to do it, but it's going to happen, and you just need to, you need to be safe. The other question, uh, can, these are some questions now that I'm starting to look at, because I think they're particularly interesting. So can my code coexist with other copies of my own library? So if you include jQuery, and then you include you know, jQuery 1.1, include jQuery 1.2, can you use them together on the same page? Will they, blow, you know, will they overwrite each other's methods? That's a harder problem to tackle. It's, it's definitely feasible. And so that's something I'm looking at, and I want to uh, get that in for jQuery 1.2. The other question is, can my code be embedded inside another namespace? 
So for example, could, could I take the jQuery namespace and copy into, let's say, Dojo's namespace? So I could do, now do dojo.jQuery. And no library can handle that. Because they, they depend on special contexts being set and special you know, naming being uh, uh, available. It's, it's, it's also a hard problem. And again, I alluded to this before, but you should never extend native objects, ever. Um, and uh, this is, uh, it's almost a philosophical point uh, right now, in that um, you know, the prototype library, it's a fantastic library, absolutely fantastic. The developers are really stand up. Um, and they, they, but they enjoy uh, extending native objects. That's just how, how they roll. Um, so, but I, I, I don't like it in that it's, um, it's, you know, they used to have object prototype, they removed that pretty early, and that extending all objects in JavaScript, it's incredibly dangerous in that you can, you can no longer iterate through an object's keys without uh, getting these random other chunks of code in. Um, but they're, they're hitting problems now. Um, but I think it's absolutely imperative that in a JavaScript library that it should first work across browser first. Second, it should have functionality. Meaning that if your library did nothing but find elements by class name, but it worked in every browser, that would be a perfect library. In that it, it achieves the goal perfectly for all people. Um, but if you can never, if there's some piece of functionality that you've implemented where you're just like, it doesn't work in Safari, sorry. You know, I don't think it's valid to claim that that is a valid piece of functionality of your library if you just, you know, if it's not supported. And in that case, so a prototype, they extend native uh, HTML elements. Uh, so they extend uh, the, the HTML element prototype to add additional methods on. But th that doesn't work in Internet Explorer. So they have these crazy shenanigans that you have to, you know, you have to perform in order to, you have to like double wrap your objects in order to traverse around. And it's very inelegant. And I don't think that's a valid solution because um, it, it's just, yeah. So, uh, and, and additionally, another issue that's coming up now is in adding methods to global objects. So specifically, the new, there's a new get elements by class name that's part of HTML5, and we implemented it in Firefox 3. So the, uh, uh, we, Mozilla, uh, in, in Firefox uh, uh, 3, and the problem is, is that Prototype also implements that method. And, and so they, well, at first, they were blowing away the native method, which is like 100 times faster. You know, it just completely blows them away. So, what they did, what they then started to do was, is they checked to see if the method existed or not. And if it did, and if it already existed, they didn't touch it, which is good. But the problem was, is that people then wrote code that relied on the return value of what prototype did. So a prototype returned a modified object that you could call a dot each method on. And because that dot each method no longer worked, it was breaking code again. It, it, it's, it's this crazy world, and, and this is why I don't like extend, extending native objects at all, because you just have the potential for just these weird mishaps to occur that you don't expect. Um, and at the same time, uh, you know, I think another, another, yeah, another one was that uh, I think Prototype used to implement uh, array dot for each. And so when it came, in, and there's a native for each in Firefox 2. And the native for each is very fast. It's lightning fast. But the thing is, is that if, if you wanted to take advantage of that and someone else had already included prototype on the page, you would end up using prototypes one because it existed, which is so slow. You don't want to use that slow one because you can do better. So it, it, again, it, it doesn't just fall back to piece, missing pieces of functionality. It also falls back to speed issues. So perform type checking. I say, I say this one, but... Uh, I do it very sparingly in jQuery, a little bit more so in Fuel. Well, in, in Fuel, you have uh, everything's implemented through an IDL interface. And I don't know if anyone's had to deal with IDL, or especially with IDL with JavaScript. It is horrible. 
uh, because you, you, essentially you can only have specific types come in, and then you essentially lose all the beautiful you know, variable length arguments that you come to love in JavaScript. So anyway, uh, by having type checking, you can make your API very fault resistant. So if a, if a user sends in a null or an undefined by accident, you can handle that gracefully and, and hopefully give them an error message to at least point them in the right direction. Another case is where a user passes in something that they expect to work, for example, passing in a number into the CSS function. Uh, so, you know, uh, setting a, a, you know, uh, the left or the height to a number. Browsers behave a little bit differently with that. So you, you can turn that into a string, you know, and add a pixel value. Um, now, the point at which I, uh, I sometimes disagree with other people is, is around error messages. They are obviously immensely useful for people to debug with, but they're also very byte costly. You know, they, they, you know they, you could be transferring many, many K of just error messages down the pipe. And I think that that sort of functionality is better left to a debugging extension. So providing your library, and you could throw in a debugging extension, and suddenly you get all these wonderful error messages. Exactly. Oh, so the question was, uh, why why not just pull the error messages in with a XML HTTP request? That's valid too. I mean, uh, I, would, I definitely consider that to be an option that you would turn on when you're in, you know, a debugging mode or something. Yeah, yeah. So there's no. There, I, I don't really consider to be any reason to pass long error messages. Um, another tip that I like. So tweaking your object constructor. I use this one in jQuery. So jQuery itself is, is an object, and you can instantiate it. But if you throw this here on the top, so window is the global object, and you check to see if the context is equal to the global object. It, that is the case when you call jQuery like this. So what that does now is that instead of uh, just trying to run jQuery like a normal function, it goes back and instantiates itself and returns that result. So now, so now this uh, statement in jQuery becomes c equivalent to instantiating it, and that it's, it makes for shorter code. You know, users don't have to worry about that, but as a developer, you still get all the benefits of having this, you know, uh, uh, this fast uh, instantiation. Another uh, quick tip for error messages: um, you should never gobble error messages. So if a user causes an error to occur in their code, especially in a, in a callback. So an Ajax callback or you know, a, a loop uh, and a function in a loop. Um, never gobble the user's error messages. It, it's, it seems really tempting in that you don't want there to be bad things happening on a page or whatever, but you should just ignore that and, and be able to let things pass through. And I, consider, I think you should even do this with your code, with the library code, and that if an error occurs in the library, don't don't consume it. You know, just let it go free. Unless you're including error messages or of some sort, you should just let it pass through, and at least give people th the hope of debugging your code. So complex applications. Um, I consider there's I consider there to be a couple solutions to complex applications. The most important of which is extensibility. And I think that if you want to write good code, um, you should keep a light core of functionality and allow users to add in additional pieces of functionality easily. And we do that in a, just about every aspect of jQuery. Because jQuery is, is you know, we just want to keep it small and light and let other people add in what they want. You know, if they want a crazy bouncing animation with some accordion widget, you know, that's fine. They can include that. Uh, but we, don't, we won't include that natively. So just as an example, here's three different ways to extend jQuery. Um, the top one is the most common one. This is a typical jQuery plugin. You're adding a new method into the jQuery object, uh, your own function, and you can now users can use it like any other jQuery uh, method. You can add in custom selectors so that users can now use your own custom selector. Uh, and you can add in your own uh, easing animation. So if you want to have it bounce an, a bounce animation, you can do that. Um, and another really important side effect of this is that it fosters 
a community. So if, if, uh, you know, if users um, you know, can release their own code and get recognition for it, you know, that's fantastic. Um, you, know, you saw a lot of that happen in the Perl community around CPAN, being able to release code and maintain it. Um, and so we're, we're doing that now with jQuery. We have a couple hundred plugins of users just contributing out. So a lot of people consider object-oriented code to be the solution for writing complex applications. Um, I get this time and time again. People will look at jQuery uh, coming from a, typically the Java world. Um, and they'll look and they're like, oh, what's this? It, it's like a one-liner. And you know, why, why not have an object to, you know, to use that here? And you know, object-oriented code is, is an answer. I don't think it's the answer, uh, especially within the world of JavaScript. It's because you have such powerful constructs, you know, functional language constructs, that it's, it, it, I don't consider it to be a, you know, a perfect solution by any stretch, at, at least not until JavaScript 2, when there's packages and classes and all sorts of nice things. What I consider to be a better solution is the use of first plugins but second, uh, secondary, having custom events. Message passing so, uh, between one object to another is absolutely fundamental to having um, a library that is usable in a complex situation. And I, I can't really stress that enough other than to say that, that all these libraries now use it. Dojo was uh, a pretty big pioneer in this, and that all of their, uh, their library and all the things that snap into their library uh, use custom events to communicate. It's, it's pretty elegant. jQuery, we use this, and we're, we're, we've had custom events for a long time, but we're getting better at understanding them and how to apply them. Yahoo UI has them, and Prototype just added them, their new 1.6 release. And so th this way, you can now for example, your component can listen for a drag event, something that nor doesn't normally exist. And you can now trigger a refresh event on a table or something. So dealing with browser bugs. So Quirks Mode. Quirks Mode, uh, the, the Quirks Mode, the website, uh, written by PPK. Fantastic resource. It, I mean, it helped me so much back in the you know, the, when, when I was first learning JavaScript. But the fundamental problem with it is that it explains where a problem exists, a specific browser bug exists. So it'll say that the offset top method doesn't quite, quite work quite properly in this browser. And that's good to know, but it doesn't tell you how to solve a general purpose problem. For example, how do you get the computed style of an element in a cross-browser manner. It doesn't explain that. It explains a particular method of an API. And I, what I think is much more interesting and much harder is uh, understanding these meta problems, these things that encompass multiple APIs. So specifically, looking at when, how to solve a, a whole problem set. There's a couple problem sets that are already solved what I consider to be solved, and that is in the area of DOM events and DOM traversal. Those are pretty well thought out, and you can find a lot of good documentation on that. But there's a lot of them that still require just a tremendous amount of hard work. So the problem of getting an attribute value out of an element, um, that one's being very close to being solved, I think. Um, the prototype guys are making good progress. We're making some good progress right now. And the one that I haven't seen anyone tackle yet, but we're starting to now, is getting a computed style. So figuring out what, how an element currently looks. And it is a, just a fantastically hard problem because no browser has even attempted to standardize on anything since there is nothing to standardize on. And um, so what I've, what I've done in these cases is to, well, uh, is, is to, in your test suite, permute just hundreds of possible values. So it tests against, and, and so I'm tackling this problem right now, getting a computer style, and looking at you know, a dozen different types of elements. Are they, are they display none? Are they visible? Are, you know, are, they, um, you know, are they a block? You know, are they uh, within another hidden element? 
is, you know, is they, you know, are they normally supposed to be in line? Is just and using so using that set of values, and then comparing, you know, the color attribute, the background color, the, you know, height, the width, and and ex and you permute all these out, and you have, you know, essentially a couple hundred test cases to work with. Do you expect that API to work in the presence of window size changes and all those things? So do you, do you expect the API to work in presence of Windows size changes? Yeah, so like, you know, you said get the computed style of element. Get the yep. computed style of element in what environment? At load time or at render time? Render time. So meaning, so at the, at, the, at the time at which you call it. So, so basically, it loads, and I, and I ask computed style for that element, and then I make the window bigger or smaller, and then I ask the computed style for that element. I can expect it to function? Yes, absolutely. Yep. And so, I mean, the, there's a lot of them that are, the, the most mind-boggling one is in Safari 2 and 3. And so in Safari 2, if you call the get computed style element, or uh, sorry, uh, uh, function, you can't. It's null. And you're like, why is it null? It's supposed to be there. And that's because when you call it on an element that is either display none or within an element that is display none, it just, it's null. For whatever reason, um, so, so Safari three came out, and I was all excited. I'm like, "Oh, great! They're fixing this problem because I know they're going to fix this problem because it's so annoying." And so I go and I call get get computed style. It exists. I'm so happy. And so I go to get the value, and it's undefined. <laughs> and they, so they implemented the interface, but they just made it return undefined now. And the problem is, is that attributes can return undefined normally. And so now there's no way to differentiate between, it, between when it should be returning undefined and when it shouldn't be returning undefined. So the only way, so my, my horrible abomination was to get the computed style of color, since there will always be a color, and check to see if it exists. And if it does, then that means that we're outside of an element that is display none. I could go on and talk about horrible hacks. I, I could do many presentations on that. But so yeah, uh, the, um, at, at least this is getting closer to being solved. But uh, again, that's the case where I think you just need to have an immense test case, one that you can't write by hand, one that you have to literally permute out. And then the problem comes up of when you do find a fix, how do you know when to find, you know, when to run that fix? And the, this is the progression uh, that I see. Users, when they start, they always check user agent. It's the easiest thing. Oh, you know, is MSIE. No one else could ever report MSIE. And then, and then you know, the, the common secondary solution that's proposed uh, by people like PPK is to check to see if a specific, a specific method exists, which is great. It works for get element ID, things like that. Uh, and, then, and then you start to think, well, maybe because there aren't quite some problems that fit into that nice method mold. You're like, well, maybe I'll think of an elegant solution. And then you just realize that you should probably just be checking the user agent <laughs> anyway. Because uh, for, you know, uh, especially when you're trying to tackle issues like rendering errors, um, it's, you, you, you just can't, you can't check that with an object. There is no way to say, you know, are you quirky when you render this thing? You know, the, the, you, you have to do checks like that. And the issue is, is that you can't rely, you can't say, oh, well, I'll just, I'll just check to see if a specific method exists that only exists in Internet Explorer 7. What if another browser comes along and implements that object? Or what if, how about, what if a library comes along and implements that object? Because that is bound to happen, and it'll drive you insane. User agent isn't perfect. I'm not saying it is, but it'll get you close. So documentation. I mean, it goes without saying that documentation is essential. But what I think is really important is something that we've uh, we've explored is specifically structured documentation. So providing a, a solid format for how your documentation should be written, either. You know, some sort of a you know Java doc, or in the in, so in, in, in the case of jQuery, we use something akin to something called a script doc. But we've since migrated, and we're we had a, an XML format. 
But what's nice about this is when you have a structured format, you can change it into other structured formats, XML, JSON, and you can give it to your users because you're not going to write the best API browser. Um, I don't think anyone has a perfect API browser because everyone wants to look at APIs in a different way. So what, we did, what I did with jQuery is, is I built an XML format that I pumped the API out in. And people took that and they made their own browsers. So now there's a, literally a proliferation of other API browsers, cheat sheets that are automatically computed, you made with X, you know, XSLT. Uh, people made desktop widgets, uh, doing translations. And all of this is because it's just a structured format to work with. And these people can literally just pull down the latest XML file and update their widget or their cheat sheet instantly. Because they, you know, they don't have to call through the documentation and copy and paste. And so it's literally an API for your API. Giving people the ability to you know, expand how the API is shown is immensely powerful. Why did I choose XML and not IDL? IDL isn't expressive enough to express what I want in uh, JavaScript. That's the short answer. Okay. Cool. <laughs> I, I just wanted to know. I, I have nothing against you using. Yep. Um, yeah, the XML format we currently have isn't standardized in anything. Simply because I don't. No one has looked at the. Just because JavaScript is not Java, um, and you can't. You know, you can't def, uh, document JavaScript using Java Doc. No matter how hard you try, uh, well, you, unless you write really what I consider to be inelegant JavaScript. Um, so yeah, that's, that's a whole other issue, but what, one we've been trying to tackle. And the other issue. What was the issue with script doc or JS doc? So the issue with script doc or JS doc is that you can't. Okay, so let's say you want to document what the context is of a callback function. Mm. What if you want to document the arguments of a callback function that gets passed to a method? What if you want to def uh, document properties that get passed into an object? Th I mean, and these are all immensely common cases for JavaScript libraries. And it's just, it's, people just ignore it. Uh, so, yeah, the, um, and even people who are at the, where I could just consider to be like the forefront, so like the Aptana IDE, um, you know, they, they, they're only part of the way there. It's just, it's a large issue. Um, so the other issue is, you know, if you're going to have your documentation in a structure format, and you want people to help, you want people, you're, you're going to make spelling mistakes, you're going to make code mistakes, you're, and, but people can come in and, and help you out. So I consider this, the current solution I have for this is to put it in a wiki. And then you have, you know, the saying is, is now you have two problems. But the, the um, at least with the wiki, my, my current tactic is to use structured templating. And as an aside, if you've ever done media wiki templating, that'll, that, that'll do something to you. So anyway, so do, use structured templating and use that to generate structured documentation. I'm running out of time, so I gotta hurry. So leverage, only uh, specifically um, write the documentation that'll help your users the most and that'll help the library the most. Because your time is limited, so you should focus on this, the best stuff first. Um, this is a rough order that I have. So start with the user API. That's definitely most important. And then, and then eventually, you start to getting writing documentation on how to write documentation so that other people can come in and know how to do it, and it'll self-perpetuate. And finally, finally, for documentation, you need, if there's no documentation, you really just have to buckle down and do it yourself. There's really no other way. Uh, so, <laughs> I mean, it, it's self-explanatory. You just have to do it. Testing. Testing is absolutely essential. Um, and I, I say don't trust any library that doesn't have a test suite, any JavaScript library especially, because of all the fantastically weird browser bugs that exist, I just I can't do it. Knowing how many bugs I've caught with the jQuery test suite, it, it, it puts fear into my heart when I see ones that don't have it. it you know, um, so currently, prototype MogaKit jQuery, Yahoo just got one. Uh, write your own suite, they're pretty easy. Uh, make sure it passes in all browsers, handle asynchronous tests. 
Test-driven development is incredibly important. We use it in jQuery all the time. We write our tests first so they start failing. And then we write the, we then it encourages us to make it not fail, so we write the implementation. And, uh, and it would be great if there was a way to have a pre-commit hook in Google Code, <laughs> because then we could check to see if we're passing still before we commit. Just, just saying. Um, oh, because I recently wrote a pure JavaScript DOM that runs in Rhino, uh, so that you can and it run and it can run the full jQuery library. There's some more information about that on my blog. I won't go into it in detail here. Uh, so the future testing is I consider to be um, so multi-browser testing, so that you can take a patch, push it to the code base, and it'll distribute out into everyone's browser, everyone who's logged in, and it'll come back with all the test results and it'll come back to you. So you can essentially d distribute your load and your test cases. And I consider this to be uh, the future. Um, and we're starting to explore that now. We'll, we'll see uh, what it leads to. So maintenance, make it easy to tackle new bugs. Uh, you, you should interact with your community a lot. <laughs> and most importantly, um, the, you, this is absolutely important, is that you need to maintain the focus of your library. And even if it's nothing more than one semi-benevolent dictator uh, standing over the project saying, no, that shouldn't go in, or no, that has to be named that way, you have to do it. Otherwise, you're going to get an, just a garbled mess of, I don't know, factory generators or something. Uh, I mean, you, you, just, you, need to, uh, you need to have oversight. And you need to maintain focus. Um, and so that's why I've done with jQuery. I, 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 you know, every time someone tries to commit, I put them through this horrible gauntlet. Uh, and, but I, I think it maintains the focus of the library pretty well. So I want to open up the questions in like the couple minutes that I have left. Um, so we have a mic here for questions. Well, see, your library like seems very nice, but is it uh, more or less targeted uh, to uh, Firefox and wouldn't actually be, well, reasonable to use it, say, on a cell phone? jQuery? Yeah. No, no, jQuery is cross-browser. Complete, uh, Fuel is, is Firefox ah, only. I see. Yeah, so, uh, jQuery is, is uh, in, in Safari 2.3, IE 6.7, uh, Firefox 1.5, 2.0. Uh, Opera. Yeah, and my cell phone uh, supports uh, uh, IE4. Sorry. <laughs> I'm not going there. <laughs> um, yes. How do you filter the noise in the community? Is that something you guys trouble with, like just loud vocal minority or stuff like that? Um, you just, it, so it, it's hard. You have to use your discretion. And um, I mean, and that, that's really the advantage of you having a, a plugin architecture, is that you can say, go make it a plugin. If your plugin becomes popular, then we'll bring it back in. You know, it, you, you tell them to prove themselves first. And, you know, if, if they, because there's a lot of people who, who are like, oh man, you know, the, I wish I had these crazy advanced animations of jQuery. No, we're not even wish. It's saying that it's a, they must be in jQuery. And you just have to say no, you know, because even, you know, especially for file size concerns. But I mean, so you can say, here, go use this plugin. So the question regarding uh, uh, the Dojo route and having multiple build sets, getting just the build set you need. You can do that right now in the jQuery build system. It, there's is a make file, and you can tailor it. Um, but we definitely want something more advanced, and we're, we're working on it right now, so that you can pick and choose what parts of jQuery. Not that jQuery is huge, it's 20K. Uh, but th at least pick and choose what plugins you want to include uh, into your custom build. But yeah, that's definitely, definitely a concern. Okay. Um, do you think that there will ever be a time when 
library development like this sort of isn't necessary anymore? Or do you actually think that the ecosystem of libraries is a good way for advancing state of the art? So will it ever change? No. <laughs> Not in any future that I foresee. Um, the, the, there's, there's no incentive for certain browsers to implement standardization. It, isn't, it simply isn't market beneficial for them. Um, so why should they become standards compliant? Because then people can go elsewhere. And, um, and so there's always going to be differences, no matter what. And even if there isn't differences, people will implement their own special methods. Let's say, like, get elements by class name, which may, maybe only a couple browsers will implement. But you want a special case to, you know, to see if that exists. And if it does, use that fast method. If it doesn't, use this other method. You know, it's, it's, it's not going away. And, and does it help the ecosystem? Definitely. I mean, uh, I've been doing CSS3. I've been using CSS3 now for about two years, which is about two years more than anyone who's ever written the CSS3 specification. Uh, it's, it's, yeah. I'm sorry, I can, I'm bitter. <laughs> OK, uh, yes. So how would I pair something like jQuery to something like Google Web Toolkit? Completely different ball game. Uh, so jQuery is pure JavaScript, client side only, um, and you know it has some Ajaxy bits to communicate, but there isn't any you know object persistence. You know, modify an object in the server, go to the client. It's um, yeah, it, it, it's significantly different in in a lot of ways. No questions. Yeah. Oh, wait, we got one right here. Yeah, just out of curiosity, do you have any information on um, what's the largest size project that jQuery is being used in, in terms of size of development team and size of code base, roughly? Development team and code base. I guess to rephrase the question, is jQuery designed more for small one-off projects, or do you think it would be useful for a project that has like 100 developers working on some massive system? I don't know. Um, I mean, it, it's definitely, I don't know of any 100 developer teams that are using jQuery. Um, but it is used, let's see, I don't know, MSNBC, DIG, uh, IBM, Oracle, Cisco. I, it, there's, there's a massive list of them on the website. Uh, it, but the, most of those teams, I'd say largest, maybe a dozen. I don't, yeah, I don't know of any massive teams like that. Otherwise, I think we would have been seeing contributions coming back from them. Say, say again? Independent of jQuery, a thought of a 100% JavaScript project is thoroughly frightening. <laughs> so the thought of a 100% JavaScript project is frightening. And I don't know. It, I, I, it, it's very different, definitely. But. Um, yeah, I, I like it, and it you know, provides a different level of freedom, and especially it, it, it brings in people from all backgrounds. We, uh, so on jQuery, we have people coming from ColdFusion, PHP, Ruby, Perl. Uh, I mean, literally, they, they all write different languages in their day-to-day -day job. And, but they all come in, and they're, and they, but the JavaScript is this common playground for developers, and they, you know, it, it's you know, it's, it's like no man's land. You know, where they you know parlay, um, and it, it's I don't know. I, I I like it. I like the language a lot, and I think it. I don't know. I like it. <laughs> and I, I think we have time for one more question. Okay. So. OK, so distributed testing. Uh, so what we're looking at with that right now is, so the users would be essentially sitting on a page that auto-refreshes uh, or, or, you know, or pulls an AJAX chunk of, of tests um, and just runs you know, those, that batch of tests you know, with that specific version of, let's say, jQuery, uh, and then reports back how many tests passed or failed, you know, or just the results. So um, we do this a little bit right now in Mozilla. We have a uh, we we imported the the 
Moki kit test, we, we call it Moki test. And um, one, of, one of the things that I did is I brought in all the JavaScript library test suites, and I had them running in this uh, little mini web server on Moki test. So the test suite runs, and then it, it, it ajax back the, the results, and then that is aggregated into the full Mozilla build system. So every time you, now when you do a commit to uh, make a change to Firefox, it's, you're running against MogiKit, Prototype, Scriptaculous, jQuery, um, the, all their test suites. So I mean, it, yeah, it's, it's still pretty experimental, but I think we at least had the foundation. What, what, what I ultimately want to get to is where any layperson can be running this in their browser so that they can load up random old version of Conqueror, you know, and they, they could test because that means something to them. So, yeah. Thanks, John. Yep. <laughs>